I am John, or Kane. Um, I am a role-playing game designer. I've been playing for about 20 years, uh, and working legitimately in the industry for about me. That was a stupid idea, because you should never turn what you love into what you do. It actually makes it work. I started out, saw somebody put a PDF online of a free role-playing game, and they said, this would be their TV. And I said, wow, well, I can do that, and I have nothing going on right now. So I found my buddy, Matt Sullivan, we sat down and we started making a game that we brought some other people in. And then we actually got people playing it and taking it to conventions. And then people really liked it, so we started hiring artists. And it got two things really kind of stop. So in the midst of that, I started writing articles for a website called Treasure Tables, which explored gaming and other game related things. After that website kind of died down, the guy who owned it went to a bunch of people that he liked to do guest articles and said, hey, do you want to jump into this new thing? I think it's called Name Two. That was three years ago, four years ago, and we've won three Emmy Awards for the stuff we've done on Gnome Stew at that time. Um, we remember so for what that was called. All the people from Gnome Stew kind of said, hey, we can make games too, why don't we invest? So then we started making uh, games like Eureka, which is on one of your tables, or Masks, for playing game supplements. So that's kind of what I've been doing in the industry. This has put me in touch with a lot of various pieces of the industry from all kinds of aspects. And there's one thing that, in all my looking at the industry, one of the things that I noticed is that collaboration is inside and out of the industry in like every single aspect. Um, there, there's no other entertainment medium that really does this in the exact same way. Technology is starting to catch up. Things like Second Life, things like MMOs are starting to catch up, but there's no other real entertainment medium that has this immediate, I'm going to change the story based on what the audience wants. And oh yeah, the audience is also the people making the story. So tabletop all playing games are basically storytelling with mechanical rules. Um, it's a storytelling exercise where you and your friends get together and play out these roles. It's unlike any other medium because there's this aspect of the collaboration. But it shares so many things with other mediums, which makes it this great kind of in the center piece that you can look at other mediums with. If you want to know what it shares with, whenever I'm asked to tell a layman, what's role playing game like? Well, it's, it's kind of like a board game, but the rules are more complex and the players tell a story as well. Right? You don't get that one? It's kind of like a book or a comic book, but the main characters aren't in control of the author. The rest of the world is, but he, has no, he or she has no idea what the main characters are going to do. It's kind of like a video game, but the graphics are done with miniatures, and your characters can attempt absolutely anything. And it's kind of like acting in a movie or play, but the audience is only four other people, and they're helping you build the story as well. Now, there's one part of this that's different that role playing games have that nothing else has, and that's people. It's the people that you game with that make this a unique experience. You can go to a concert, you can watch a movie, you can sit down and play video games or hang out with other people, but they are not actively involved in creating whatever that experience for consumers. They're involved in the social aspects of it, but not the actual, I'm going to say, no way, the movie should go this way. You know, hey, why don't you play that other song? They don't have that kind of control. So the people you game with really help make this game, and everyone at the table is a creator as well as the audience. If I'm the game master, the person in charge, I know a little bit about what's going to happen, but I don't know what they're going to do, so I have to keep that fluid for them. So, I want to show you what this is like, not just talk about it. So, if you make sure to pick up a character, we're actually going to play with those characters as we go along. So, how many of you have had experience with table level? All right, a fair amount. That is excellent. Means we are going to go left instead of right. All right, here we are. Here I'm going to this part. You and a group of comrades stand in a cold and damp dungeon. Walking down the hallway, you find passages leading off to the right and to the left. Turn to the left and encounter a door. Slowly pushing it open, the torch in your hand illuminates a room with a small pedestal. On it is a book entitled The History of Rolling. You pick it up, and the words on the page are hard to make out. That's all flavor text. That's a description that I've prepared beforehand. 
I'm introducing an error development, but I don't know how you guys are going to actually react to this. I'm only 40% of the author of this thing. So if one of you says, hey, I want to read this, I say, all right, go ahead and grab a D20. And roll. You have to get above a 15 to read this, to make out the text. Oh. If you have some kind of skill modifier in your list of skills in the bottom right that you think might help you, in that gray column, add that. All right, who got under a 15 with that modifier? All right. Your success is in the level castle. Um, <laughs> If you fail, or if they're hard to read, you pick out some of them, Tolkien, Elves, Gygax, Cheetos. Um, but most are hard to understand. Now, if I wanted you to understand that as a GM, this sucks. Because I intended some element of the story to build up on this. But because you fail, you gotta do something completely different with this. I had to take that story and change it. If I were making a movie or a book, this was Indiana Jones picking up the, the pin that's going to give him the clue how to get past the next trap. There is no way of having you to feel that unless that was what was driving the story. So this element of this book may become something that drives the story later. You may take this out of the dungeon and say, hey, we can't figure this out. We're going to go get it translated somewhere else. You may say, eh, I'm going to go on. Who cares what warnings that have for that? It may become something that becomes even bigger than I anticipated. You go, oh, all the information is in this book. And I say, all right, yeah. And so now the rest of your quest as you're trying to defeat the evil wizard or demon or whatever your main goal is, revolve around trying to get just a little bit more of this ancient wisdom. So the players drive this story too, and it has to be fluid. So, did anybody succeed? Excellent. That brings a social dynamic back. Everybody has different roles, so if one of your friends succeeded, they may be able to read this book and say, hey, here's what it says. So everybody kind of collaborates on keeping the story going. All right, so if you succeeded, you actually get to know about the history of role-playing. Um, <laughs> role-playing is kind of starting when two guys named Dave Artisan and Gary Gygax took J.R.R. Tolkien's style fantasy that was real big in the 70s and miniatures war gaming and stuck it together into D&D. Dungeons and Dragons, which is a one role-playing game that people haven't heard of role-playing games probably haven't heard of. It's kind of the big daddy in the industry. All right, so there's Gygax and Artisan, and they put this Dungeons and Dragons thing together. Well, they did that about 1974. About 1975, they made this Western one called Good Hill. And somebody else made this one called Tunnels and Trolls, which is pretty much exactly like Dungeons and Dragons, just a little bit. And somebody said, hey, you know what? I like fencing. Let's do a fencing role we'll play. Focus on that. And somebody said, Bunnies! We have to have bunnies! How many? A lot. I don't know. More than two. I can't count that. Then it moved into sci fi, then it moved into sci fi when you got to control the ship, then superheroes. And this is only a small selection. After the 70s, it kept spreading into more sci fi, more fantasy, superhero, secret agent, horror, horror, like we call it the a dimension hopping one that brought everything together. More secret agent stuff, more sci fi humor stuff. This brings up to 1986, and this isn't near the amount that came out. There were a whole lot more. And it kept spreading, and they started doing let's do giant robots, let's do it without a setting, let's do soul magic user stuff, let's do vampires and werewolves. And it kept going and going. This is the list of Wikipedia. These are only the ones that made it into Wikipedia in the 2000s. Mine came out in the 2000s and is not in there. And it actually has a following of about five or 600 people. That's not bad for the industry, but it's decent. So there are a lot of role-playing games out there. So why did they spread so quickly, especially in the early days? Well, there are two things. Collaboration. As gamers, we collaborate on building the story. So why shouldn't we do that as the industry? We have no idea what we're going to do when we sit down again. We've got kind of an idea, but we take in other people's ideas. So when somebody else says, hey, I want to make a game about bunnies, ah, cool, let's see what that's like. And there is this primal want to be in the story. 
Have you ever seen a little kid come back from watching a movie and go play? Watches the Avengers, starts playing with his toys. And he puts on a cape and says, well, now I'm Thor. Well, now I'm this. OK, then Thor, Thor and I go off and do this. They immediately put themselves into the story. And that's pretty primal for us. I do that all the time when I play video games. I sit there and I build these ideas into the story with my avatar because they let me put myself into the story. So this is a pretty primal one, and role playing games fulfill that. They also give us an audience to be. But what actually makes a role playing game role playing? Because, like I said, video games, I can include narrative elements into a video game when I'm doing it, or I can add myself into a book that I'm reading and kind of imagine a different outcome as I'm reading. Well, there are a couple of things. First, role play. You actually have to be part of the story. You have to have some way to interact with the story. There have to be mechanics. There are rules to this game. Something to guide how you interact with the story and how the story interacts with you. There actually has to be a story, even if it's as simple as we kill some orcs, we take their stuff, it's cool, we go back, we get that more power. So long as there's story elements to that, it's a role play. And the social. This is the audience for this, and this is really important to it. Because when you're telling that story and other people are reacting, it legitimizes it so much more. When they're building off of what you do and actually working with you to make this shared story, it turns it into this different experience. All right? So social dynamics are really important to the story. <laughs> we all have a social place in these stories. So I want to talk about how that social dynamics and collaboration affects the story. First off, let's talk about our characters. Our characters are our gateways into the world. Anybody pick a swashbuckler character? Alright. Why did you pick a swashbuckler character? I like the picture best. I am. It seemed like you have a cooler weapon than the rest. Okay. So what kind of things do you expect to be doing with a swashbuckler character? Uh well, there's always a chance for something like a pirate story. All right. And maybe something but like I, I said, the word swashbuckler makes me think Harold Flynn. Okay. <laughs> so your character is currently standing on a ship. All of a sudden, one of the rigging's comes out. Top of you. What do you do? The rigging's coming down. I might leap out of the way and grab a rope that's hanging free. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and attempt it. Give me a D twenty roll. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any skills that you think might help? It doesn't matter, I rolled one. <laughs> <laughs> so, the rigging falls down. What happens to you? You're right under it. It's flying on top of you. I, I, I expect to be that uh, with one, I'm either hurt, bad, or tangled up. Okay, you're tangled up. You also pick a swash bubble, right? Yeah. What kind of things did you expect to be treated? Uh, same sort of thing. Pirate things. Pirate things? Your fellow swash is yes. on the, uh, <laughs> what do you do with this? What do we do with that? Sorry. You see things. Oh, right. I, um, he's tangled in the rigging, so I use my sword to, uh, tie him. All right, hold that in one. Go ahead, roll with your 20 and add in your combat. I'll give you 10 extra experience if you bring me a dice, which I forgot to bring for myself. <laughs> 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 What'd you get? Six. Six. That's not very great. That's a That's 13. So. 13. That's good, because that's what I was Part of the rules that I put in are that you have to get better than that. The story's full, and he fell out of the way. He didn't get out of the way, but you try to cut him out, and you succeed. Okay, you're on this pirate ship. Where do you guys want to take the pirate ship? Are we in charge of the pirate ship? <laughs> well, there is a captain. Do you there want is to captain. be in charge of the pirate ship? There is a social rule for this. For what? What's the captain look like? <laughs> Get the captain out of power. What do you want to try this? Um, 
I uh, rally the rest of the swashbucklers on the trip for a coup? <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead and give me uh, a roll of your speaking skills with your modifier there. Okay. Ooh, that would be a 26. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your speech like? What's your impassioned speech like? There's all these people on your side. Or um. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is how a story is fluid and how it relies on the character. Because you guys pick swashbucklers and say, yeah, this is what we want to do. That's kind of like the talk that I would have with any player at the beginning of the game. I, this is a character you built. Well, why'd you do this? What do you want to do? Okay, I will make sure to try to incorporate elements of that into my game. So, even if it's not at the start going to be a pirate game, that's why it's swashbucklers to be doing that. I've got to respect that in some way. So, the story is always changing itself to suit the audience. It always has to be about your goals and your character's personalities, no matter how many of them there are. And I'm always going to be looking for ways to insert opportunities, because I control a fair amount of the narrative, but I'm going to be handing it off to you in situations like that and see where it goes. This makes the story cater to individual players for at least a little bit of the total time. And since you're the audience, it produces incredible results. You guys wanted to see taking over with the captain. You wanted to try that. You went from there. Can you imagine what a director or an author would do would you to get that kind of ability? Oh, so you guys don't like Jar Jar. All right, well, let's kill him after the first scene and move this in and go from there. We put in a new character. All right. But another person says, well, I kind of wanted to do this. All right, let's try this kind of thing for you, because you give me feedback instantly and effortlessly. And you can't get that kind of thing with a static movie. All right, story cohesion and group unity. You guys have already taken over from the captain, <laughs> but it's a little different when you're working with other players. The captain in that scenario is an NPC, a non-player character, some character that I just can't control. But when you're actually with other players, look around at everybody else in here started to take over from them, I'm going to attack you, I'm going to get the group to rally against you, they would probably have an issue with you in real life, because you just cut into their fun. So, party conflict happens, but the group unity kind of trumps that. Alright, I'm going to give you a clip from a movie called The Gamers, which is a brilliant movie for these kinds of discussions, because the people who made this are actual gamers, and they sit there and go, we want to make this as valid as possible. We want to show what gaming is like. So they go and actually do this. So looking at this is the closest thing I have found in a movie to what a game is actually like. Tell us for more care Do your worst. Kill me if you must. I will never tell. Of course, I have a game. Then we'll have to torture. Oh. We'll have to think of something else. Torture is dishonorable. Also, it won't allow. God, I love paladins. Can't you just step outside for a while? Actually, no. Uh, paladins can't let evil acts happen if they know about them. It, it's just a lie. Yeah, they're a little stupid. Uh, distracted. I'll tell them there's a ninja outside. I seriously doubt you call for that. Normally, the dice decide that sort of thing. An evil
pursued the story in one way. The book couldn't happen. We couldn't let that happen. So one of the characters says, hey, we can work around this, it uses an in-game mechanic to kind of change the story. Since they're bound by the mechanics, the player of the Paladin says, okay, I will go off and follow that. He may not like it. There's a similar scene where these two characters want to get on with it and move past. But this one wants to do a little bit of role playing. Sure is that way! I know some people look less worthy. The sooner you tell me what you know, the sooner you can safely return to your land. Well, it may be nothing, but I've heard that things are not right in the West. <laughs> <laughs> So the group changed 
got more of that shenanigan-esque aspect of it, but it also got more of that, hey, we like the way you game, we like doing this. They did more role-playing with that new person in their group who changed the social dynamic. And that brings us to the fact that everybody plays for different reasons. You can't beat that, it says, the GM has had it. No superpowers, no die plays, no, no ginormous guns, we're playing girls, bunnies, and burrows, and you're all a bunch of frickin' rats. <laughs> Everybody plays for different reasons. Everybody has a different thing they want out of the game and a different fun scenario. When we start in, we see our friends playing out different types of characters, doing different types of things, and it helps us realize that the people we know are getting different types of enjoyment out of this. So let's go back to the, the gaming scenario again. All right, somehow each one of you gets separated from the rest of the party. And to get back to them, you need to get to the other side of the locked door. Now, how you do it is totally up to you. So, every player, go ahead and roll a dice. And, does anybody have a six? A six. A five or a seven? Sure, yes. Yes. All right, what character are you playing? Paladin. Paladin, all right. You're on one side of the slot door. How do you get past it? Okay, go ahead and roll that, add in your slipping skill, and then tell me what it looks like. Um, I have a nine. Okay. Oh, let's see what it is. You do not quite get it open. It, it looks like you've got it jimmy a bit, but, but you don't quite do it. So how do you get past it? Um, you want to attempt it again? Well, since I can't, I can't use my slipping skill to screw the evil door, so I'm going to use spell people. All right, okay, I will allow that. The way that power works is you spend a point and you use your holy light. It deals four damage to any unholy creatures or takes a negative two uh, from away from the bones because they're blinded. How do you know the door is evil? Justify that to me and I will let that happen. Because it withstood my efforts to break through it with my smithing skills. Okay. It should be way before the messenger of light. All right. You activate it. It goes off. You have dispelled the evil door. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody with a barbarian? Roll your dice. Just you? Just me. All right. Uh, I think you're going to get this one. How do you get past this door? I, I, I've got a big old axe. It's probably just like a chop. Okay, go ahead and make your combat roll. Just roll a d20 and add in the combat modifier in the gray column. Okay. I got a 26. 26? <laughs> that succeeds. <laughs> Do you want to describe this for us? You have full narrative control. Go ahead and tell us what this looks like. Well, even though I'm a barbarian, barbarian it, it seems that I'm also a scholar, so I don't use my axe lightly. Right? So, so she's also kind of started to take the hinges out of me, kind of work my way down that way so we can take it out and save it, you know, in case we want to pull the door later. Okay. <laughs> I have a door. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, that paladin, barbarian. Um, how about a thief? Who has thief characters? All right. Go ahead and roll your dice. So you get closest to what I roll. Who has close to a 13 or a 13 exactly? What'd you get? I have a 5. Alright, 60 is closest to a 13. So, a thief character, how do you get past this door? Um, I tried to use my thieving ability and make a lock. Your lock Alright, go ahead and roll a d20 and uh, add in your modifier. Okay, this is 6. Is that 13? Yeah, 13. You got a 13. You got more than what it needed. Alright, you pick the lock. What does it look like? Uh, okay, so I have the lock on my lock. Dark, but I'm a thief, so I've got a free night vision. So, okay, the lock, open it right up. Uh, okay, uh, it's a watch Go ahead, roll 20. Let's see which one it gets us. Closest to an 8. Or, or? I'll see the 4. All right, whoever would like to take this. Okay. And there was a chain, and I could use my acrobatics. 
have skill to like parkour up the walls and shit. Go ahead and roll a d20 and have a better. I got a 7 plus 6, 13. Alright, well, there's more than 10 that you needed, so you got that. Open this up. Wizard, that's the only one we have. Anybody playing a wizard? Mage. Mage, okay. Go ahead and roll a d20. Closest to a 5. You got a 5? Four. 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 How do you, as a mage, get past the door? The same way mages do everything, except on fire. <laughs> 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 right. So according to the rules, you spend one point and you can do combat at it. Go ahead and roll your magic ability. Um, you set it on fire. How, what does your magic look like? What are the thematics for?
Four? The specialist? Oh, how about four? <laughs> Any other gamer types that? I'm usually a method actor, which is why I'm in the novel. Yeah. Or I'm GM. Yeah, so then I get GM all. GMs make good method actors, or method actors make good GMs because you do like to get into multiple characters. Uh, yeah, I usually have GM in play. Method actor, method storyteller, and like I said, it's definitely not all of them. Because people, ah, this time I want to do this, or this time I want to do or you know what, in this situation that's occurring, I didn't know we were taking the game this way, we're breaking it in the Duke's palace, ooh, ooh, I can be a tactician, I can do that now, which is going to be more like what you enjoy doing. Alright, so, having different gamer types really forces collaboration, because you have to take on different roles. You have to get the game going and the story going with multiple people playing for different types of reasons. It can cause a conflict in the party, but as the Gamers Club showed, that kind of meshes itself out as things go along. But it really enhances the fluidity of the storytelling that you do, because you have to do it for multiple personalities. 